Everybody good? Wonderful. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Randall Hunt. I'm a software engineer at Amazon Web Services. I'm a technical evangelist there, too. Uh, the term technical evangelist, all it really means is that they pay me to fly around the world and have fun. Uh, I strongly suggest it as a career, as a job. If you're interested, we are hiring in Germany. Um, and you're welcome to reach out to me after this. This is my contact info. Uh, I respond rather promptly uh, unless you ask a complicated question, and then I may never respond. No, I'm teasing. I, I will respond as best I can to every single email I get. This presentation and the work here that you see today is actually mostly the work of my colleagues. Um, I have other sessions that I'm doing in other cities that, that is my work. That said, uh, anything that you see wrong with this presentation is my fault. Anything that you see correct is uh, Danilo's fault. Um, so I made all the mistakes. Danilo made everything good. Uh, I strongly encourage you to tweet at me. Um, if for nothing else, then it's really funny. And just I apologize. One moment. I'm just going to fix my, uh, my little remote here. Um, oops. Or maybe I won't. Whatever. It doesn't matter. We don't need it. Um, OK. So tweet at me, at JR Hunt. Does, do people use Twitter in Germany? Yeah? OK. There, there are lots of uh, Lambda functions that back my, my Twitter account. So also my text messages, and also the majority of my familial interactions at this point. I don't think I've actually sent my mother a text message in like four years. Uh, it's all Lambda. So uh, and then I, I also live code on twitch.tv slash AWS uh, most Tuesdays and Thursdays. And you can watch us build a lot of serverless applications there. Cool. So this is Danilo's book. Uh, he wrote Lambda in Action. It's been translated into several languages. I'm not sure if German is among them, but I think the, the English language comprehension here is quite good. So you may be able to read the English version and benefit. Did I mention that he wrote a book? Yeah? All right. So uh, you guys, wh how many people were here in the first session? And how many people here have some experience with Lambda? Uh, so I'm going to ask. For those of you who are experts in Lambda, to put your hands up. OK, what about medium? Medium? OK, what about learning? Great. So for the purposes of any video, uh, it was about 20% uh, expert, 20% learning, and then I'm really bad at math for the other part. <laughs> so. What I want to talk about is the developer experience within Lambda. And this involves not just coding Lambda functions, but also modifying existing Lambda functions. So what is your continuous integration and continuous deployment strategy there? And there are a couple tools that are, are really important in the development of Lambda functions that I, I'm going to call out today. But first, let's look at what a Lambda function is. This is kind of the, the, the core of most of our serverless applications. Uh, a function is essentially a piece of code that is running a handler. Uh, it can be in Node.js, Python, Java, C Sharp, Go, whatever language you want. And there it, it can respond either synchronously or asynchronously to, to changes in data state, streaming data, whatever kind of event that you use to invoke this function. This could be an HTTPS call through API Gateway. It could be uh, a Kinesis stream making a call for a record. All of these things are possible among many other event sources. And then uh, it can do anything, right? It's just code. So anything that you can do in, in your mind that you can get into code, you can do in a Lambda function. There are a few caveats to Lambda functions. Um, you can run between 128 megabytes of RAM and 3 gigabytes of RAM, and your build in RAM seconds, memory seconds, gigabyte seconds. Uh, that's very analogous to a kilowatt hour. So the way that a kilowatt hour works is uh, Y if you, or the way that a gigabyte second works even, is if you use 128 megabytes of RAM for 10 seconds, that's one gigabyte second. So you will build one gigabyte second for those 10 seconds of 128 megs of RAM. If you use three gigs for 0.3334 seconds, that's almost a gigabyte second. Um, and then you're build for one gigabyte second. If you use one gigabyte of RAM for one second, that's one gigabyte second. And that's how you're build. Uh, now, the other important thing to keep in mind with functions is that the amount of RAM that you provision also scales your CPU. So as you add more RAM, you also get more CPU, and that's important. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but your assumption may be that the cheapest thing to do is to run with the lowest amount of RAM. But if your function completes in a shorter amount of time given more CPU, that may not always be the case, and it's important to identify that. And there are tools that we've built, uh, and actually something that the community built that I think is even better than what we built, uh, called Lambda Power Tuning which creates a step function, which creates a bunch of different aliases and versions 
of your Lambda function across all kinds of different memory profiles and figures out what's the cheapest or what's the fastest way for you to run this function. It's a very powerful tool, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So there are a lot of common serverless web cases, uh, ser serverless use cases. Um, the, the thing that I most often build is a simple web app. Uh, I've also built Lex chatbots. I've built data processing, um, even analytics, machine learning, uh, even large MapReduce jobs. There's a framework called PyRen, and you can actually get almost 20 terabits of throughput to S3. You can do uh, m hundreds of teraflops of compute using Lambda. Uh, that may be a little expensive, but again, Lambda is quite cheap, and it can also be a great way to scale out tremendously horizontally. Um, and this is a very powerful paradigm. Uh, I think this paradigm, I, I was in the audience at reInvent. reInvent is this conference that we have in Las Vegas every year um, where we, we make a lot of announcements and we have a bunch of the AWS developer community and, and partners come out and, and you know, share their stories, share their experiences. And I remember when Werner was on stage announcing Lambda, there was a portion of the audience that immediately got it and thought this was going to be game changing. You know, this is going to be one of the greatest things ever. And then there was another portion of the audience that uh, was just, what the hell is this? I don't care. Um, and that was mostly the press. Um, but one thing that I noticed about reInvent in 2017 is no one was asking, you know, what is serverless? How does this work? Everyone was asking, how can I use this? And I think that's a drastic fundamental change that's happened in just three years. And I don't know how long people have been involved in the tech industry, but we've been around for a few paradigm shifts now. We've been through the shift from, from relational databases to non-relational databases, back to relational databases. Uh, and we've been through a number of other shifts, too, where, where we've kind of changed from monoliths to microservices or distributed monoliths. And we, we find in these, these paradigm shifts a tremendous amount of opportunity to drive business value. And that's the core takeaway from this presentation is regardless of how much time you invest into tinkering and, and, and building and doing stuff, uh, the core part of serverless is that it allows you to differentiate your business. So it allows you to focus only on the parts of your code that allow you to differentiate your business. That's a very powerful concept. I never have to sit there and like patch Nginx again, right? I never have to be you know, knee deep in, a, in Apache config you know, figuring out how many micro whiskey containers I need to be spinning up in order to serve this number of requests. Um, am I speaking English too quickly? Sushna? Great. It's going to get faster. So the other core component of serverless technologies is that you never pay for idle. This is one of the, the, the really cool components, uh, and this is true of all of the things that we release under this kind of serverless moniker. Uh, you are not paying for time where you're not executing. So I'm curious, if I were to ask those of you who map utilization within your existing compute clusters, uh, how many uh, would say your utilization is above 50%? There, that for the purposes of any video, that was no hands. How about, how about above 10%? It's a fake binary search. OK. Um, above 25%? Good. Above 30? OK. So we've got two people left in the room. Um, so. I've been in a couple of jobs where I've been brought in and they've said, hey, my utilization is at, is at 3% and we want to get, get better. And I was like, okay. So I just do kind of select all of the EC2 instances and then I go delete. Uh, and then I rewrite most of that functionality in a Lambda function and suddenly we're at 100% utilization. Uh, oh, and our, our AWS bill went away because the entire app runs within the free tier. Um, and this has actually happened to me with a number of customers. And I've seen a number of customers be incredibly successful with this kind of a paradigm. So. Again, the, the pricing is very cheap. I believe this is for US East 1, but the, the actual pricing doesn't matter when it's in microsense. Um, it, you, you, know, you, can, you can figure out how exactly your app is going to run and what your performance is going to be, but that's not really part of the developer experience, which is what I would love to focus on. So uh, these are the event sources that you have, uh, among many others. There are a couple of management tools. Uh, chief among those, and, and, and not listed here, is something called AWS X-Ray, so, uh, or Amazon X-Ray. X-Ray is a code instrumentation tool, and I, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. But does this work? Yeah, it's working now. Cool. So uh, you have CloudFormation, which is typically how you're going to be deploying and updating your apps, right? So you'll write these, these DSLs. Um, CloudFormation is a, is a DSL. It's um, a domain-specific language, or 
if you'll pardon my language, a, a damn specific language. And uh, you have to be very precise with CloudFormation and, and kind of go out and say, this is what I want. This is the thing that uh, I want to provision. And writing it by hand um, is a mind-numbing exercise that no one should ever undertake. So we have a number of tools that, that make that much easier for you. Uh, and then we have CloudTrail. CloudTrail is how you kind of audit the activity within your, your, your account. You can see Lambda functions. You can see uh, other API calls, modifications, stuff like that. You have code commit. This is just a, a repo. You could use GitHub as well. It's totally fine. And then CloudWatch. CloudWatch is where all of your logs for your Lambda functions go. Uh, we have a number of partners, if you don't like CloudWatch, that allow you to stream your logs there as well. Something like IOPipe or even Datadog. They both have integrations within Lambda that can provide a lot of rich context. And I strongly suggest checking those out if you already have existing stuff on those, those partners. Um, if you don't, CloudWatch will probably serve you just fine. Um, and then. We have kind of endpoints. This could be Alexa. This could be step functions, IoT, API gateway. And we can send things with SES. In fact, if you are interested in receiving uh, a small AWS credit, you can email credits at ranman.com, and a Lambda function will respond to you uh, after doing a little bit of fraud validation and send out uh, a small credit code to you. Um, so that's a, an example of a Lambda function that we can show today. Uh, and we also have SNS, and then we can do cron jobs. Um, cron jobs uh, can run in one minute intervals. They're CloudWatch events. Cool. So the Lambda execution model works something like this, where you have an API gateway, for instance, coming in, uh, and it's hitting an endpoint. Uh, let's say this endpoint is you know, HTTPS myapi.com slash order, and that's invoking a Lambda function. What you don't see in this step is that I could have a couple of different things here. I could have a custom authorizer. That could be something that's going as its own Lambda function, looking at the headers, looking at the, the given API key, and diving deep and saying, hey, is this API key you know, valid? Have they exceeded their quota? I can do a number of other different kind of authorization things. One thing to keep in mind with the custom authorizers is that you don't have access to the request body. You only have access to the request headers. So you have to make sure that you architect your application in such a way that you are making use only of the request headers in that custom authorizer. If you do need access to the whole request and you don't want to write uh, any kind of custom transforms or integrations, there's something called a proxy invocation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, let's look at the second kind of in invocation model, which is asynchronous. Uh, the asynchronous invocation model works with things like uh, SNS or S3, where let's say I upload a picture to S3, and I want to resize this picture or much more fun use case is I want to replace all the faces in this picture with mustaches or, or ninja masks or, or lederhosen. Um, and this is, this is quite easily done. Basically, uh, when S3 receives an upload, I can subscribe uh, my Lambda function to respond to all put events or all delete events or all kinds of events on that S3 bucket. It will be invoked. It will be able to get the event data and perform some action. Uh, and this is an example of asynchronous. Then we have stream-based. Uh, the stream-based invocation model has a number of strange and interesting caveats. So DynamoDB streams are essentially the same as Kinesis streams. A Kinesis stream is, is not dissimilar from Kafka, Apache Kafka, if you've ever worked with it. And the idea is that you have these, these small granular records going into a stream, uh, however many megabytes per second you want. There's a model called sharding that allows you to partition where, where in the stream that's going. And then Lambda also has a, a concurrency model that's built on top of those shards. So the more shards you have, the more concurrency you can have within your Lambda function for that Kinesis stream. Then the Kinesis stream can actually, the, the Lambda function can actually read from different places in the Kinesis stream. It can read from the last record that was sent. It can read from the beginning of the stream, uh, from whatever last success successfully processed record was. There are all kinds of different optimizations and changes that you can make there. Within DynamoDB streams, you have the option of getting the old document, the new document, or just the new document, or just the old document. And this allows you to do things like multi-region replication, except you don't have to do that anymore because we released that, and it's just easy to do. It's like a checkbox now. OK, so how does the permission model work? Have you guys used identity and access management? Yeah, I think this is probably one of the first services that people encounter when they come to AWS is uh, IAM. Uh, it's one of our core services. There's a lot of like features and innovation and a lot of really hard people, uh, a lot of like really hard work being done by really talented people in the service to make it better and easier for people to use all the time. And the way that this works is you have two kind of uh, policies. You have the execution policy. The execution policy is, you know, what can invoke this? Uh, what, what, what does it have access to when it's invoked? And then the function policy is almost like um, you, you know, 
actions on bucket X are able to invoke lambda function Z. Uh, so they're, they're the, the lambda function essentially under the covers is using something called STS, simple token service, to assume a role and perform actions as that role that you give the function. Um, and if that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. It's not important until it is. So, uh, let, uh, you know, we have, we have our example app here, right? We have, you know, a mobile app or a website or various services accessing over the internet our CloudFront distribution, uh, which is talking to our API gateway uh, or even talking directly past the CloudFront distribution. CloudFront, by the way, is a CDN. Um, so it just distributes and caches things at ed edge nodes all around the world. There are more than 100 points of presence for the, this CDN. It's very powerful, uh, and it has lots of features. You can even run Lambda functions at the edge on your CloudFront nodes. So there, there's something called Lambda at Edge, which has a uh, smaller execution time. So instead of five minutes execution time, you are limited to 30 seconds. Uh, but you can run 1.5 gig functions at the edge and there are plenty of people that I've spoken to, a lot of customers, who are now running their entire application on Lambda at Edge, saving a tremendous amount of money, never having to go back to their origin. Pretty powerful stuff. Um, and you can even call out to like databases and uh, other APIs from that Edge location. So you go to your API gateway here, and then maybe your API gateway is starting off some sort of manual process or starting off some sort of stage tiered process. And this would be the step functions. Uh, API gateway is logging everything into CloudWatch, Pardon me. Uh, and then we have uh, endpoints for communicating with all of our, our infrastructure. Now, we can also provision our Lambda functions within a VPC. So the way this works is you get an ENI within your VPC, and an ENI is an elastic network interface. And that ENI consumes an IP address within that subnet, and now you have access from your Lambda function to all of your uh, stuff within your VPC. This is pretty powerful. There are a couple caveats to keep in mind with that, though. Um, provisioning an ENI is not instantaneous. Releasing an ENI is not instantaneous. So the scale of Lambda that you get when not running in a VPC, uh, the scale can go much faster. Um, so you can go from zero functions to 1,000 concurrent invocations to 10,000 concurrent invocations to 100,000 concurrent invocations with very little effort. Um, th there's some default limits in place. I believe those are like 3,000 functions concurrently. Um, but those limits are not in any way uh, you know, hard. They're just there to protect you from getting an unexpected bill. So a, a simple support case to AWS should be automatically approved, and it should automatically increase your limit. Uh, if you need a substantial increase in concurrency uh, you know, on the order of you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of executions per second uh, or, or, or concurrent executions per second, then you do need to have a little bit of more than just that, that auto-approve step. But Within our VPC, when we provision these additional addresses, we have a bunch of things that we need to think about. For instance, we can run out of IP addresses in a subnet, and then we are limited in our concurrency within our subnet by that. So you have to make sure when you're creating your subnet for your Lambda functions to run in that you have enough IP addresses available that you can support the concurrency that you want. Good things to keep in mind. This is going to be covered a little bit more in the, the architectural patterns and, and global um, multi-region active active serverless backends talks. but. Moving along, uh, API Gateway is a great way to kind of do a giant reverse proxy into whatever service you want. Um, it is extremely full featured. You write transforms for the incoming content and the outgoing content with something called velocity templates. So has anybody worked with Java before? Yeah, it is Germany, and I understand that there are a lot of legacy applications. Um, <laughs> is that, did I just make a lot of enemies? I'm sorry. Um, so there's, there's this old templating language called Velocity, uh, and I say old, but it's actually still updated, uh, and it's an Apache project that is used in everything from Jira to Tomcat to, to you know, whatever kind of Java system you have, it's a templating language. And these templating this, this Velocity templating language is used in API Gateway to allow you to transform your, your request that's coming into your Lambda function, as well as the data coming out of your Lambda function. So you can add things, remove things as needed in those templates. Um, and I think there's a, a maximum size that the templates can be, but uh, I've done some pretty absurd stuff, like calculating CRCs based on the response, uh, and then do a base64 encoding it, and then SHA-256 hashing it. Like, I've done all of that in a template, and it's basically like free compute. So use it. Um, it has built-in DDoS protection and throttling. And again, it has custom authorizers, and you can 
you know, add in whatever quota systems you want. Cool. So I told you earlier about proxy integrations. I think proxy integrations are the easiest way to take existing applications and move them quickly into Lambda. Um, uh, the way that a proxy invocation works is you're essentially saying, I don't want API Gateway to be responsible for any kind of method transform or any kind of uh, request transform. I only want it to be responsible for taking the incoming message and forwarding it to my Lambda function. And then it'll populate these fields. So you'll get the resource, which is going to be the path, uh, uh, or uh, yeah, the, the path that it was requested, the path of the, the actual request. Then um, the HTTP method, this will be something like get or post or options or any or no, no. Uh <laughs> and then you'll have the headers, you'll have the query string parameters, all kinds of stuff. I'll talk a little bit more about stage variables a little bit later. But you go into this request context, and you can have whatever kind of custom author authorizer stuff you wanted to populate with. Then you have the body of the request. And then because we could, we added is base64 encoded true or false. Um, then you have to respond in a particular fashion when you have a proxy integration. So you need to respond with the status code. This is going to be 200, 401, 405, 666, who knows. Um, and then is base64 encoded true or false yet again? few headers, and the body. Um, if you have an existing, uh, does anybody use Flask? Python, Flask? OK. If you have an existing Flask service, or even an existing Django service, there's a framework called Zappa that is particularly powerful in just with zero code changes, taking that and deploying it on an API gateway and a Lambda function. And it will manage everything for you. Literally, you go into your, your existing Flask application, you type Zappa init. Zappa deploy, you now have a serverless version of your Flask application. It will take care of packaging all the libraries. It will take care of everything for you. Um, I'm a Python guy, so I spend quite a bit of time uh, playing around with Zappa. There are a couple other frameworks as well. There's things like Chalice. Um, and I'll, I'll cover all the other frameworks later, but uh, I think Zappa is, is probably one of my favorite tools to use uh, in terms of simplicity, because I have a lot of applications that I've built over the past 10 years that I'm bringing now into serverless. And it's extremely easy. Like I don't, I don't, I don't even have to think about it. I just zap it in it, zap it deploy, and it works. Pretty powerful. So uh, let's take a look at the Lambda console. So uh, one of the things that I want to point out about the Lambda console is back in twenty uh, some years ago, we acquired this company. What year is it? Is it twenty eighteen? Wow, time is going like super fast. Uh, is that happening for everybody else? Is time just getting faster and faster? OK, maybe it's the compound. There's no compression algorithm for experience. This is called the uh, AWS bingo section. We, I, what are the other words that I need? Undifferentiated heavy lifting. OK, I've hit all the bingo words. Um, so uh, a few years ago, we acquired a company called Cloud9 uh, in Amsterdam. So we, we, we met their developers, and we thought, hey, you guys have kind of the same core principles that we do, and you have a really cool service, and uh, we're really interested in continuing to work more with you. They maintain an open source project called the Ace Editor, uh, which is still open source, still maintained. Uh, and they also had kind of a more full-featured version of that Ace Editor, uh, which was put into an integrated development environment, an IDE, uh, called Cloud9. And so we acquired this, and we released this service at reInvent some year. I, my perception of time is totally off, so I don't remember if it was last year or the year before that we released it. Um, and it has native integration with Lambda. So if I want to edit an existing Lambda function, all I need to do is just double click on that Lambda function. It's imported, and I can use it. But the best part, the best, most important part here is that it has Vim key bindings. Does anybody use Emacs? Great. Oh, well, the exit's over there. <laughs> um, no, it has Vim key bindings. So you can be tremendously productive, even just in the console. So let's take a look really fast at the Lambda console. And this is kind of our first view into the uh, serverless developer experience. Oops. So we're going to go all the way to the West Coast now. So I thought we might build a simple function. So earlier today, I asked everybody, what's, what's a simple idea that you would like to implement in serverless? So does anybody have any ideas? Don't everybody shout at once. Anything at all? Uh, an, AP, an application for API Gateway? We'll definitely do that. 
uh, something specific, anything at all. I, I promise I should be able to code it, unless it's you know crazy. So CSV to like JSON or something. All right, let's do it. Okay. So the the typical way that you would start is you would just go to the service application repo and you would type CSV, and you would see if there's anything that already does that for you. Uh, and it doesn't look like there is. Um, but the serverless application repo, SAR, uh, is a great way to get started with almost any application. You can find applications created by the community. You can even publish your own applications there and eventually monetize them. So you can actually earn some money from publishing your applications. And when they're used, uh, you have this opportunity to, to earn a little bit of money. And you can also use it as an onboarding platform for your existing services, so if you're a partner of AWS. But it doesn't look like we have one of those. So I'm going to start from scratch. I'm going to say Python 3.6, because that's the greatest language ever. Uh, and we're going to say, hello, Munich. And we're just going to use a, a role that I created randomly. Doesn't, it doesn't matter what role I choose, because it doesn't look like we're going to be accessing any other services. The first thing that I want to point out is, if you see on the left side here, you can see what the triggers are. So right now, I don't have any triggers. We would pass in a trigger of a type like uh, API Gateway, or a type like S3, where when somebody uploads an S3 uh, CSV, we're going to transform it into JSON. Then we have over here uh, the things that I have provided access to. And in my infinite developer wisdom, I have not followed one of the best practices. And I have done, let's provide access to everything. And then I've given access to AWS X-Ray. Since I've already given access to everything, I don't really need to give access to anything else. But I manually specified a bunch of this stuff. This brings us to the ACE editor. So this is part of the Cloud9 IDE. The very first thing that you should do is go to keyboard and enable Vim, um, wherever keyboard is. Yeah. So now you can actually write code. So oh, yeah, I should make it a lot bigger, shouldn't I? So uh, we're going to import CSV. We're going to import JSON. And then we're going to say uh, for event and event records, uh, csv.load. I don't remember. So does anybody else do this? They just go Python, CSV, read string. Nobody else does this? OK. Because I, I, I program with Stack Overflow. I'm not ashamed to admit it. This is like my everyday. So we go and we say CSV reader. Oh, I'm going to have to create a bytes IO object. That's fine. Um, import IO. Uh, IO equals uh, IO dot buffered here. You know, this would be a lot easier if we just hopped over into a cloud IDE where I could manage all of this. So let's go into the real Cloud9 IDE. I'll provision it now. Create environment. Let's say, um, hello, Munich. Um, and because I don't pay my AWS bill, we'll go with 256 gigs. <laughs> we'll go with 256 gigs of RAM and 64 vCPUs. And this will take just a moment to provision, uh, maybe three, four minutes total. Um, but in the meantime, we can continue just playing around here. Um, import IO, um, IO.stringIO, uh, buffer equals, sorry, I'll make this bigger again. I'm, I apologize. Um, buffer equals string IO. And then we'll say um, buffer, and let's. Uh, What uh what do we want to pass in? So name, date, people, uh, and then a new line, and then we'll say Randall uh, today. <laughs> uh, how many of you are there? Let's say one thousand million, and then we'll say uh, CSV. So import CSV CSV dot reader. Uh, buffer, delimiter. I don't think I need to pass in the delimiter, actually, because it should be auto-inferred. Uh, and then, sorry. Then for row in A, print uh, row. Great, cool. So that's sort of working. That's the basis of our code there. We could hop back over here, and we could say um, string IO equals 
Uh, so we'll say buffer. It's going to be string IO equal to event. Yeah, this is not right. We'll say record. Record. And then we'll say uh, for what? We want to transform this into JSON. So what if we just do uh, stuff equals <laughs> buff csv.read. How did I do this earlier? I've already forgotten. Uh, reader buffer dot read. Great coding. A plus work here. Uh, and then, and I'm, I'm teasing. This is the worst code that I have ever written, and I apologize for all of you being forced to struggle along here with me. Uh, so then we will say, let me just make sure that this works. Um, so uh, io dot string io name date people and I should probably close that. Yeah, this is when the vim key bindings come in handy, but I don't have them enabled here. So we'll say io dot string io. Whoops. Uh, and then open quote name date people. And then did I get all that? And then a equals yeah. Um, read sorry. Let's let's see what things it does have. No, so it's I have to iterate over it. So I think if I just go um, list, that should work. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just call list on this uh, like the noob that I am. And we will say um, return JSON dumps uh, stuff. Or maybe we need to create like a bigger thing. Big stuff equals. And then uh, big stuff dot append stuff. And then we do big stuff. Yeah. So that should work um, for our simple function. And then we'll save it. And I never really left the Lambda console, right? Like everybody agrees that I never left the Lambda console. I didn't have to think about how any of this worked. I didn't have to go to Stack Overflow. Uh, but one of the cool things here is that now that I've written this function here and I've gone save. Um, oh, and let me let me just because again I don't pay for my bill, um, and we'll just set this to be like five minutes. Save, um, and then I want to enable active tracing. Yes. And enable active tracing will actually enable me to see in X-Ray the, the functions that are being invoked, which is a pretty powerful thing. Um, and I can put in any tags I want in the function. I can put in any environment variables. I can add this to a VPC quite easily. Just go in and put in my subnets. But I don't care about that, so I'm not going to do it. Um, and now, if I want to import this, I can hop over into the Cloud9 IDE. And you can see all these remote functions here. Maybe you can't in the back of the room. But what I want to do is say uh, import hello Munich, which I think is this one. And I'll just say, yep, import. And of course, the best way to edit functions now is to close the editor and open Vim. No, I'm teasing. Uh, but we have a really cool tool. There's, there's a tool called, uh, oh, make it bigger, sorry. Uh, there's a tool called Sam Local. Uh, before I even get into that, there's another really cool feature of Cloud9 that I always forget to demonstrate, which is the ability to invite people. Um, and if anybody were an IAM user in my account, I would invite them right now, and we could edit live together on stage. Um, there's also this opportunity to kind of even do uh, federated authentication. Um, you do have to build all of that functionality yourself to create the IAM user, deregister the IAM user, and stuff like that. But you can bring in uh, users to actually edit in line with you. Um, so I could invite, you know, whoever I wanted to this uh, instance, and they would be able to join me and write code or even just read and follow along. And they would see my terminal. They would see my editor. They would be able to see everything and collaborate. Uh, so let me make the terminal bigger, too. Oh, I guess I can't. Um, so uh, I've imported this function. But now I need to generate a test event, right? Like I need to know exactly how this event is going to be gener generated. So I, I don't know how to make this font bigger. I apologize. Um, go big. Um, so we can do it like this. So there's something called Sam local. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say generate event uh, S3. And SAM local works by running a Docker container uh, or even a series of Docker containers on your machine to actually allow you to invoke Lambda functions locally, just as if they were running out in API gateway, just as if they were running out uh, on Lambda and you were invoking them with a the Kinesis stream. And you can also generate these sample events. So I could even pass in you know, a sample event like uh, um, uh, bucket is going to be Randall stuff, and then key is going to be stuff.csv. And it would actually populate that event for me and give me all of the example put. So you can see stuff.csv here, all good stuff. So that's an example of how you can use uh, Lambda functions to get going rather quickly. Uh, this was actually built so I could you know, call out from an, an S3 uploaded file and see what happens there. Um, I don't remember what the exact record looks like, so it's good that I have this record here. So it, it looks like if we go event records, for record and event records, uh, we get the stuff.csv. Uh, all of that is pretty good, but you wanted an API gateway integration. So let's change our function around a little bit and just see if we can return something uh, from the event like this. So we'll change this record into event body. And then if I need to see what the event body looks like, we can go and say during ev generate event. It no more yet big stuff. I is that it's the best I can do. Sorry. Um, I got a, I live in Los Angeles where we're very vain. Um, so I've had lots of plastic surgery. No, I'm teasing. But I did get laser eye surgery, and I feel like a mutant now. I feel like I have supervision. I should have been a pilot. You know, I, I can see everything. Like, I don't even have to zoom in. It's, it's awesome. So if you have the opportunity to get laser eye surgery, I strongly recommend it. Um, uh, it was extremely painful for me, but that was because the doctor forgot to put the anesthetic in. Um, n n normally, normally, it's not painful at all. But that's not important. Uh, and then I forgot what the possible events are. So API, gotcha. So we can get an API. Oh, and this is a proxy invocation. So uh, it'll still just be body. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rely on uh, my probably completely wrong memory to, to see if this works. Uh, all right, so we can save that. Uh, and then I could even run it. You know, I can run it locally and test it all. Doesn't matter. Um, but what we really want to do is we want to create an API. So we hop over API gateway, hop over into the console. Da, 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 da. We'll create a quick API. Um, I'll call this Randall Munich. Delete me later. Uh, and we'll make this edge optimized. We'll create the API. All good stuff. We'll create a method. Yeah. Uh, and we'll just make this a uh, post. And we'll say call out to a Lambda function, hello Munich. Save that. OK. Uh, we could have made this a proxy invocation as well. Um, and this should just work. You know, there shouldn't be any issues. Uh, I need to deploy it. And since I'm a developer and not an ops person, um, we'll just deploy directly to prod. I'm glad you guys are laughing. Uh, and then this is what we can do, is we can say uh, curl-d um, name date people. I think I still have that for loop there, don't I? It's not going to work, is it? So let's hop back to our function so that it'll work the first time I invoke it. Probably won't. That's fine. Uh, and remove that silly for loop that I made, unless I already did that. The reason this is taking so long is that I'm running it in US West 2, which is very far from here. I think it's technically like 9,000 miles from here, um, which is where my house is. So I'm excited to go back. Yeah, did that wrong. Uh, oh, so I see my function didn't actually save. That's why. 
So now if I want to put this back, I kind of close this out, I hop back over to AWS resources, and then I say, hey, deploy. Uh, and then if I refresh this page, it should be updated. Should be. Yeah, so it's updated now. Um, so all, you, all I did there was I just clicked this function, and then I clicked deploy, and it was back in my regular IDE. So we'll say curl-d, uh, this URL, uh, and then I don't think we need anything else. And could not parse request body into JSON, unrise, unrise, unrecognized token name. Um, yeah, that's because I'm telling it to expect JSON. But you get the idea. This stuff is easy to build, um, except when I'm doing it. Uh, let's hop back over to the presentation really quickly, uh, and I'll go through a couple other things, and maybe we'll come back and I'll show you some more demos. Cool. There are a lot of really cool uh, little keyboard shortcuts that are super useful within that ACE editor. Um, the, the one that I think is most useful is actually the, the uh, full screen. Uh, I don't know how the rest of you program, but I typically program with just my editor and nothing else except Stack Overflow. Uh, and then you can configure your test events with Command-J. Uh, the test events are kind of saved and cached, so you can use them uh, on the function. So y you saw that was like a lot of manual work, right? Like that was a lot of stuff to be tinkering around with in the console and also locally, and just kind of moving a bunch of different pieces around. And you don't necessarily want to do that. So we built something within CloudFormation uh, that, that allows you to provision all of this. But even within CloudFormation, it was still overly verbose. Uh, you were having to specify every single little thing uh, when there are a lot of sensible defaults that are provided for you in the console. And one of the ways that we got around that was we created something called SAM. And we gave it this really beautiful, cute little mascot uh, so that you wouldn't hate the fact that you were writing JSON or YAML. Um, so this is SAM. And SAM stands for Serverless Application Model. Uh, <laughs> and what it does is it applies a transform on an existing CloudFormation, tra uh, cl sorry, CloudFormation template. And uh, it just makes it a lot easier to provision things. So it adds a couple of new resources for you, things like function serverless or simple table, not to be confused with simple DB, for those of you who remember those days. Um, and it's an open specification. It's, it's on GitHub. All of the code is open source. You could implement this yourself uh, for Azure functions or GCP functions. Like It's not specific to AWS, although I guess by default it is. Uh, and this is what a SAM template looks like. So uh, at the top, we have kind of this, this version that's saying, you know, this is the, the CloudFormation template version. And then the important part is this transform that we're loading in, this AWS serverless transform. Uh, and then we create define a function, which is called git HTML. And this function is going to be loaded from this location, this zip file. It's going to have a runtime of 6.1. Now 8.1 is available. Uh, and then it's going to have a policy of Amazon DynamoDB read-only access, and we're going to define an event of type get HTML, type AP, uh, uh, named get HTML of type API with the properties that it's a proxy invocation, so it'll pass all methods into that. Pretty cool, pretty useful. Um, previously, in order to do all of this, it would have been uh, much harder. So all of these resources that you see here are actually being transformed into an IAM role, an IAM policy, a function, a REST API, a stage, a deployment, a permission, all of this stuff that you don't really want to deal with, right? Like there's no reason for you to write this if you're using simple stuff. That said, I will say that as you move into production or as you move into kind of a defensive coding posture, you're going to want to change this permission section and you're going to want to change this IAM role and policy section and kind of overwrite it with, with some sensible defaults for your application. For development, it's not important. Just go with like the stuff that kind of works best for you. But when you get into you know, a production deployment that you're doing continuous integration on, make sure that those policies are locked down specifically to the resources that you're going to be accessing. Th all of that turns into this. Um, and even with my laser eye vision, uh, I can't tell what the hell is going on. I have no idea what, the, like, this is just too much stuff for somebody to have to go through. And that's why we made SAM, is so you don't have to. So the really easy way to use SAM is to just call uh, CloudFormation package, uh, or even there's an alias for it, so SAM package, um, and then SAM deploy. And you just pass in the, uh, the template, and it will deploy it all for you. Uh, but even that is too complex. I like visuals. I don't. I, I spend all my time on the command line. But let's imagine that I like visuals. Um, 
it would be really, really powerful if we could just point and click and say what we wanted to build, right? Uh, I thought I was way over time when you came in, sorry. <laughs> so it would be really, really fun and powerful if we could just point at things and make them, them suddenly turn into functions. So my colleague, Danilo, uh, who is the expert on serverless, he wrote a book about it. Did I mention that? Yeah, just a few times. So I want to show you Danilo's project, which is called Serverless by Design. Basically, I can go in, if my thing loads, I can go in to this, and I can say, I want to add a node. So let me add a node of type uh, DynamoDB table. And I'm going to call this table delete me later. <laughs> and then I want to connect this Lambda function to that table and give it permissions. So I just drag it and drop it, and it has all kinds of animations. Whee! Um, and you can change the physics. It's a lot of fun. That's the most fun part. And then you can click Build, and it'll give you the information to call it out. You can go and you can say Export, uh, and you can export all of the data. It'll download. You'll get this uh, little zip file. The zip file will contain a sample function. It will contain your template, and it will have all of the stuff built together for you. So this is called SBD, Serverless by Design at DanilaP.net. I strongly recommend checking it out. It can save you a lot of time. What I will say is I wouldn't use the templates that it generates as the de facto standard for what you should do. I would use them as starting points. I would use them as a means to, to build out the rough design, and then you go in and manually edit it and build out all the components that you're, you're, you need to. So that's pretty powerful. And then we, we covered Cloud9. Um, Cloud9 is very powerful. The, the really cool part of Cloud9, too, is that uh, it actually uses a lot of local caching. So after it's loaded once, um, it will load up very quickly, even on very bad, poor connections, very, very, very poor connections, um, like an airplane or a Deutsche Bahn train. Um, and you can you can edit code with this massive machine backing you, right? You know, I had I had sixty, what was it, two hundred and fifty six gigs of RAM and sixty four vCPUs, uh, and that came up in less than two or three minutes, and I, I suddenly had access to it. And the other benefit of it is, again you're trying to get towards that point of not paying for idle. So if you don't use the machine for 30, 30 minutes, or you can customize this, uh, you can make it four hours, you can make it several days. If the machine's not running and you're not accessing it for a certain period of time, uh, it will shut down. Uh, but then it comes back quite quickly, and it preserves everything. It's just where you left off. So again, when it comes into testing, uh, we talked a little bit about CM Local already. But you, you do have to think about testing a little differently with serverless applications because you are limited in the resources that you have on your Lambda function, whether it's a Lambda at Edge function or a regular Lambda function. Again, am I speaking too quickly? Slow it down a bit? OK. There seems to be mild consistent consensus in the audience that I'm speaking too quickly. It's a common problem for New, York New Yorkers. So. When we go into testing things, we have to take into account the fact that the RAM that I have on my local laptop is not the same as the RAM that I'm going to have on my Lambda function. The CPU that I have on my local laptop is not the same as the CPU that I will have on my, uh, my Lambda function. So I need to make sure that the Docker container that I'm running is right-sized to whatever kind of Lambda function I do intend on running. And even then, the instruction sets won't match. It'll be a slightly different environment. So the best way to test is actually uh, on a Lambda function itself. And there's a really, really cool tool that I mentioned earlier on in this presentation called Lambda Power Tuning. This is by Alex Casabloni. Um, this is strange. Whoa. How do I? That was weird. Um, so this is called Lambda Power Tuning. And this allows you to take an existing Lambda function and create a bunch of different versions and aliases of it. And it will tell you which one is going to run fastest or which one is going to run most cheaply. And counter to your intuition, sometimes a larger function will actually be cheaper uh, than, than a smaller function. So your intuition may lead you to believe that 128 megs of RAM, smallest function, so long as it completes, is actually the cheapest way of, of running. But that's not true. Uh, sometimes the three gig function with the two vCPUs, if you're CPU bound, is the fastest way of running. Uh, and you can see what it's doing here. It's basically defining a step function that goes through and sends all of your executions to a bunch of different ones. Uh, and then it'll give you some output, and you can use that output to right size your function. And I think that's one of the best ways to kind of deal with right sizing. And again, we covered SAM local already, so I'm going to skip past some of that. 
Uh, you saw me generating events earlier. And Sam Local, again, is open source, so you're welcome to contribute to it. Uh, there are a number of other tools besides Sam Local that interact with Sam Local, so you can actually emulate many of the existing AWS services, things like Kinesis or DynamoDB. Uh, Atlassian released a tool that I can't remember the name of right now that emulates all of those uh, ser serverless components, things like Kinesis Streams. Yeah, people are taking pictures, so I'll leave that for a second. OK. So uh, it has a great man page. And I always, uh, I always value my tools by how good the man page is, except for set. So you can start your API. You can run your API locally. You can generate events. You can invoke your function locally, all that good stuff. Uh, and it's available in Cloud9 out of the box. So when it comes to deploying serverless applications, and this is the last part of my presentation because I can tell that people are starting to fall asleep. So uh, I'll up the energy a little bit. We can talk about. Continuous integration and continuous deployment. Isn't that so exciting? No, uh, I understand. Um, the, the goal here is to be as boring as possible and to be as easy as possible. So if you don't want to have to deal with setting any of this up, uh, you, know, you, you can set up your own source. You can use GitHub. You can use code commit. You can set up your own build, Jenkins, code build. You can set up your own testing, you know, Circle CI, Travis CI, whatever kind of components you want to use, or even even you know our, our code build service and, and code pipeline service, uh, and then you deploy it all with CloudFormation. I, this is the only step that I actually kind of stick by. Um, people use tools like Terraform and, and, and other tools to to kind of provision these things. Um, having worked with Terraform extensively, I will say that I think CloudFormation offers a, a better, uh, more constructive set of primitives for you to build things from. Uh, although Terraform is a little prettier to look at. So if you don't want to set any of this up, there's something called CodeStar, which will set it all up for you. Uh, again, I strongly recommend checking the service out if you're just looking for somewhere to start and you want to iterate. You can go and you can say, I want a Python web service built on Lambda, or I want a Python service built on Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, it's not just for serverless, but it is one of the easiest ways to get started with serverless. Uh, and this integrates somewhat with those existing uh, serverless application repo services that I showed you earlier. So you can have, uh, within serverless application model, access to a couple of deployment primitives. Now, these deployment primitives are allowing you to shift traffic between two versions of an API. So let's say I, I, you guys, I'm sure, have heard of blue-green deployments, right, where you cut over the DNS. So you have like an entire separate copy of the infrastructure, and then you cut over the DNS at one point. Um, that is a, a great method of deploying, and that's supported. But one of the really cool things to do is to actually shift traffic grad gradually between them. That way, you can see if something's starting to fail when it hits a production load. So you can start out, and you can say, let me take 10% of my traffic, send it to my new API. I'll leave the rest of the traffic running to the old API. OK, let me switch 20% of my traffic over, 30%. And then typically, after things hit 50%, I just call it and like push everything over because, I again, prod. Um, and so I could take that application that we built earlier, right? Uh, and if I wanted to add a safe deployment to this, all I need to do is to declare a global, which is a function. It's going to have an uh, auto-publish. And I'm going to have a type of canary, 10% every 10 minutes. Da -da -da. And then I can add some hooks, too. So I could have hooks that would roll back the web deployment. I could have uh, hooks that would, would roll it forward. It would change things from canaries into uh, to production deployments. I don't think I've mentioned canary deployments yet, so let me take a moment to tell you how awesome these are. Um, canaries are, are, it's a common term named after coal miners. Uh, they would send a canary into the mine, and if the canary survived, uh, the mine was safe. And if the canary, unfortunately, did not survive, then they sent the miners in anyway, and they all got lung cancer. Um, this is the story of West Virginia in the United States, if anybody's ever been there. Um, and you can set all these alarms that'll go off and tell you, you know, OK, the, the canary's not working. But who here writes Java? Again, this is 100% of the audience. We are in Germany. So I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Uh, and I, I guess it's mostly C-sharp. Um, so we, we have, in Java, these, these eye charts called stack traces. Uh, and looking at one of these makes your eyes bleed, literally. I mean, you're just kind of like, how far down do I have to scroll to get to the relevant part of the stack trace to know what went wrong? It's a lot of data. 
And Java stack traces will produce this stuff endlessly and happily hum along endlessly until something goes you know, horribly wrong and you run out of memory, you run out of space. Uh, and with CloudWatch logs, you won't run out of space, so it'll just keep filling everything up. That information is not useful in production. That is information that's really only useful when you're developing and debugging, hopefully. So with a Canary deployment, you can set a bunch of variables that say, OK, I want you to turn on exception logging. I, wanna, I want you to turn on tracing. I want you to turn on uh, debug level stuff. And I want to find out everything that I can. And then the second that I promote that Canary deployment into a production deployment, I can change all those variables. I can turn it off. I can say, OK, I no longer need access to that level of information. I only want you to do info logging. So think about all the variables that you set in your development or in your, your test cycles that you would love to not have to do another deployment just to change those variables around. Uh, that's really easy to do with Canaries. These are really good animations. <laughs> so um, this is what the code deploy console looks like when you, when you do one of these kind of um, uh, not Canary, but traffic shifting deployments. So you can start out. You can say, OK, I'm going to start sending 40% uh, of my traffic to the new version and 60% of my traffic to the old version. Um, and then we already demoed Cloud9 and Sam Local, so uh, we're going to skip ahead to the takeaways because hopefully, oh no, you have one more session before lunch. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> um, I, well, I was going to hope to release everybody for lunch, but instead, uh, I'm just going to skip ahead really fast, which and say, uh, if you take nothing else away from this, take away the fact that it is quite easy to get started with developing serverless functions, and the experience is rather pleasant uh, compared to some of the existing development paradigms. Uh, if you use something like Visual Studio Code, you have native integration with Lambda, so you can, you can just open up Visual Studio Code, install the Lambda plugin, install the same local plugin, and all of a sudden you have uh, all, all these great features for working with C Sharp and Lambda. Uh, the .NET performance in Lambda is quite good. And the CI CD capabilities of Lambda are far and away uh, one of the best things that I've ever gotten for free. Uh, I don't actually have to do any setup or any kind of you know, thinking about getting this stuff going to, to be able to use it. Uh, so if you're going to take anything else away, take that. And if you're going to take nothing at all away from this presentation, just remember to buy Danilo's book. So thank you all so much for attending this talk. Uh, there are going to be more talks later. Um, and I strongly suggest sticking around for those. I have a little bit of time for questions. So thanks again. <laughs> are there any questions? Great, I'm going to go to lunch. <laughs>